hmm, what's this? I don't remember signing up for that, but all right, let's check it out. Welcome back, Troglodytes, to your daily dose of guitar information, the Troglodytes Guitar Show. So I got this email from Emerald City Guitars, and I was just scrolling through it. It's like, okay, yeah, they've got some cool stuff. But this email just kept going on and on, and I fixated on this. A 1967 Gibson Melody Maker in Pelham Blue for a ridiculous ridiculous $6,700 price tag. The SG Melody Makers of the late 60s are pretty cool. I've had a refinished one back in the carpet era, but generally speaking, they top out around 3,000 bucks. So how is this one so expensive? So naturally, I click, and nothing new in the title. So my first thought was, okay, maybe is it one of those rare 12 string iterations? And nope, count the strings, there's only six. Because finding a blue 12 string would be pretty rare. It looks like we got a ding over here, but that would lower the price, not raise it. It's not one of the triple pickup versions, it's a tour. Moving on to the back, looks like we got the original strap buttons yet. Those are pretty iconic in their own right. But yeah, not seeing anything special. So then I go to the description. A rare SG Melody Maker D in an original Pelham Blue finish, featuring the wide Gibson headstock with Stinger. Yes, indeed. Okay, typically the headstocks look like this. They're the short Melody Maker style. However, towards the later years of production, you can find ones with the larger style headstock. For example, Here's another one for about 3000 bucks. It's got the same wide headstock. So that's not why this one's so expensive. It's because of this ridiculous factory stinger, according to them. That's crazy to see on a student model guitar. That had to have been completely custom ordered. I mean, it looks like it's got the original serial number on it yet. But now their two times market value price makes a little bit more sense in my head. But they actually have a video of this guitar if you're interested in hearing how it sounds. They have a nice YouTube channel themselves if you're interested in checking out some vintage guitars. Today's video is not sponsored by them. I just happened to get an email and went down a rabbit hole. Because the next is the suggestions here. A 1973 Gibson SG Standard. So this is the year right after the Top Route era, whereas like the SG Deluxe had a big route on the top. 1972 is when they started to transition away from that, but by 73 they were all back to being back routed. And look at the wood grain on this mahogany. That is one of the nicest looking bodies I've seen on an SG Standard of this era. But interestingly enough, we do have a Bigsby B5 style unit. It's actually Gibson branded, so it was factory original. We've got the harmonica bridge that these are known for. And if the pickups are still original, it'd be the super humbucking tarbax. But the next thing that caught my attention is unbound rosewood fretboard. What? Typically in this era, you will find a bound rosewood fretboard with small block inlays going all the way up the neck. Or you can also find an unbound ebony one with small block inlays going all the way up and down the neck. But this one... It doesn't go all the way up and down the neck, and we don't have the binding, so what is the story here? But reading our description, doesn't look like they mention anything special about this one. But the back is just about as beautiful as the front. It looks like our strap button has been replaced at the back. It almost looks like there's some finish missing right here by the neck. We definitely have some chipping going on down here. And okay, seeing it in this lighting, there's definitely something going on with the finish of this one. <laughs> Not exactly sure what. And that's such a darn shame, because that would have been like personal collection keeper worthy. We've got Grover tuners on it currently, and it does have the volute, and it just seems to have been some sort of a player's grade instrument. So here's my best theory on this guitar, having not seen the gut shot. It could be a new version that they were trying out. Or whenever you find an SG standard in this era that has specs that are unusual, it's typically because somebody has converted a different model SG to look like a standard. For example, in this same era, there was an unbound rosewood version of an SG standard called the SG Special, and it had mini humbuckers. So it's very common for people to route these out and try to make them look like a standard. But the other thing that's different is look at our headstock. Typically, when this is just a remade whatever, you don't get the crown. Because the specials did not get that. It was just a blank headstock outside of the Gibson logo. So due to that reason, and the fact that we're missing an inlay down here for some reason, makes me think there might be more to the story of this one. So those were the two that drew me in. Everything else, let's just do some hunting here. Check this Epiphone out, an Al Custom. This is a surprisingly attractive guitar. So we've got the semi-hollow style body going on here. No F-holes at all. Extended controls down here. Looks like instead of a pickup selector switch, you select the neck or bridge with a slider. Okay, maybe master volume, master tone, and then who knows what this stuff does. But man, it blends high-end arch top elements into it too. So maybe this is more like a 330 and it doesn't actually have a center block. I'm just thinking out loud here. Then like the Trini Lopez style crest down here or Barney Kessel. You've got this artist's model with your trapeze style tailpiece. And then, ooh, interesting. A zero fret nut model 
with kind of an interesting Mother of Pearl logo on the headstock. Okay, I was correct. They call it a hollow body here, so there is no center block. And apparently all these controls over here is part of their proprietary tone expressor. Which cool, looks like they have a video on this one. So I'll let you check out the rest of the Alkaola custom there. Next up, I love these 2018 Les Paul Studio Deluxe. Before the whole Adam Jones Silverburst craze happened, nobody really cared too much about these. It was just a good way to get a Les Paul Studio with binding along the fretboard for a pretty fair price. But once the madness happened, the values on these things skyrocketed. You used to be able to get them under 1200 bucks, but then they quickly became like 16 to 1800. But now that the market has been absolutely flooded with Silverbursts, it's currently sitting at 1600. You know, coming from a reputable shop, that's not a bad price. Price. But the additional fun thing here besides cosmetics is the fact that you have fancy electronics. You can coil split, you also have a boost on board, I and mean, you've got four push-pull pots to mess around with. Now this is kind of an interesting R9. So they claim it's from 2007. I guess that would make sense because that's when Triburst was produced more so heavily today, generally on the 68 reissue customs. It's basically just Cherry Sunburst that has a dark rim border around it. But this top is phenomenal. Not having cream plastics, the black works really well with each other. And somebody thought this top was so beautiful they took our pick guard off. That's a pretty dark, streaky rosewood fretboard as well. But then the back is completely black. But it does indeed have a 59 reissue serial number, pretty late in the year 2007. But, oh, okay. It initially had cream plastics. I don't know about you guys, but 4500 seems very fair for that guitar. Now, you gotta remember, being birthed in 2007, it doesn't have the hide glue construction of the modern day ones. But if you dig this finish, you're probably not gonna find it in too many other places. It's got one of those interesting Johnny A hollow bodies. This is still one of those guitars I need to check out in the future. They're kind of like SGs mixed with the Les Paul mixed with the 335. They've got the interesting inlays on the fretboard. That's what attracts me most to this model, but then you get the unique F-holes. And then this one actually has a mahogany neck with the mahogany back, but you can find so many varying different specs. And lastly, don't forget the cool headstock. Triple bound with unique inlay. As far as reissues go, getting a Murphy aged one from 2002 for only 6,000, that doesn't seem too bad. But ah, that's why they've messed with the finish a little bit. That seems like a questionable thing to do when Tom Murphy has aged your guitar, but okay. <laughs> it's got a beautiful top nonetheless, and it's a good thing that they're being honest about it. Next up, beautiful Heritage Series Les Paul Standard from the early 80s. I still need a standard from this series for my collection, so I'm always on the lookout for just the right one. But basically, this series was Gibson's first attempt on trying to do a 59 reissue in a mass production run. Now, you can check out the Les Paul KM episode to learn about all the asterisks and intricacies that go into talking about the finer details of the 59 reissue. But that's a pretty broad general statement about the Heritage Series in general. These are great guitars. They're not great if you want a perfect 59 reissue get an r9 in that case because we still have the nashville style bridge and a whole bunch of other specs wrong but they're cool guitars for the era that they were birthed in so this one's got a pretty nice top although it's got a little bit too much wear for me personally although i've seen these priced way worse than that but this next one i clicked on because i thought oh that's one of those mod collection les paul standards but then as i zoomed in no those aren't custom pickup covers those are just custom pickups in general according to the description they are zuzu pickups which are handmade in philadelphia which i'll be honest i've never heard of these but it looks like they can do just about anything you want. Oh, that's cool. Tweed style pickup covers. You can even have abalone for your pull pieces. So maybe manufacturers could use those on like their art guitars in some way. But this guy must have liked them enough to put their sticker on the back of the headstock. That's going to show up under a blacklight test. Some other honorable mentions within the Gibson category. L5P. Those things are pretty cool. Vintage Firebird 7. 1994 100th anniversary 350T. A three quarter size Les Paul Jr. But let's check out some fenders. The first thing that caught my attention was the 66 Stratocaster. This one, if I was gonna get one, it looks pretty nice. It has the right amount of finish checking. Looks like a little bit of chipping even right there. But there's that big giant headstock. Okay, maybe this isn't the one I'd buy. <laughs> it's funny. I like big headstocks on Les Paul Customs, but when it comes to standards and like fender Stratocasters, I'm just not that big of a fan of them. But they definitely do speak of a certain era. Next up, there's a beautiful Stratocaster Plus. Not much more to say about that besides being a very nice sunburst color. This Made in Mexico 2021 Fender Limited Edition is not too shabby either. But check this out, a 63 Fender Base 6. Currently just cut the price 5,000 bucks and they got a demo video. And it's a custom color, it's called Shoreline Gold. It appears to be in pretty good shape. Looks like they even have the Fender Mute on it. We've got a matching headstock too, and Jaguar style pickups. However, this example does have a replaced nut and professionally rewound middle pickup. 
But what on earth is this thing, a cooter caster? I've heard of that before, but I've never seen this. <laughs> is that how it's supposed to be? I mean, we've got a Bigsby on here. We no longer have the Trem system. We've got a Gibson-style bridge. We've got the remains of an original Stratocaster-style bridge. Okay, so apparently that's a Rickenbacker horseshoe pickup in the bridge, and this is just a completely modified Mexican Stratocaster. That is hilarious, but I love it. I remember looking at this one now when it was up for auction, but even that looks a little bit more tame as compared to the slantedness of this and all the other craziness, bigs, bees, and whatnot. And then here's a pretty cool Fender Custom Shop that appears to have been reworked in the Rocky finish, serving as kind of a happy medium between the true Custom Shop Rockies that probably came out after this thing was painted at 20,000 plus, and the Made in Mexico version that just recently came out that's averaging around 3,500 or so on the used market. But holy cow, if you're a collector, look at this early thin line, and it's absolutely gorgeous. I love the way this pickguard is aged. It's got a couple of nicks and dings, but you still got the ashtray cover over it. That is a phenomenal piece. And you can just tell this is going to have a little bit of dancing within the wood grain, almost like a little bit of bird's eye going on. Yeah, that's a cool one. I'm not surprised they're asking $17,000. And then lastly, a master-built Todd Kraus Lowrider Stratocaster. It's certainly an interesting design. Got some lime green, some white along the edges with a little bit of brown pin striping almost. You've got a roof in the center. Yeah, this design completely beyond what I know about, but hey, it's kind of cool anyway. All right, Troglodytes, I hope you enjoyed checking out Emerald City's guitars with me today. Definitely a couple of interesting ones in their shop. Don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe, and we'll catch you tomorrow on the next one. Take care. If you enjoyed tonight's episode, consider subscribing. I post videos like this every day. And you might even enjoy this next one.